Priest. Right. All right, so how are we for Open NSM, the Open Network Security Monitoring Group at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. We're going to go ahead and go to the uh, group updates now. So uh, we do have a Twitter account, so at Open NSM. And you can also, if you want to use the hashtag pound Open NSM, you can. Uh, we are looking for sponsors to build our Open, our, our NSM lab. Um, we like to host it in the cloud, or the other idea that we have is a Gennady cluster. So um, that's something I'm kind of working on now, but we still need some hardware. So if anybody's interested in supporting that and additional research, it's all detailed at the Google Doc um, document right here. So just follow that link and uh, see, and then take a look at it. And then if you have any, um, if you're able to actually support us in any way, do, uh, do get in contact with us. Um, we now also have. A, we are now on our GitHub account. It's a GitHub organization. I changed from a regular account to an organization, so it's easier to collaborate with other people. So if you would like to contribute to any of our repositories, including our meeting notes, um, send me your GitHub account, and then you will be able to add any news items, uh, research papers, uh, tools to the notes yourself. You don't actually have to contact any one of us to, to add it for you. So it kind of cuts out the middleman, helps to hopefully be more efficient. Um, I applied for an Amazon grant for our Open NSM Lab. I also applied for uh, Oklahoma State University's Open Source Lab for web hosting because we have to move our system from um, NCSA to another to another um, service provider. I also wrote an article called "What Is Open NSM" that you can find on this website right here. Uh, it's a blog I've been running for a few years that gives you more details about the group if you're unfamiliar with it. We're going to go ahead into the uh, meeting section. So NSM in the news, a few things. Um, a few weeks ago, um, Bert released, I think it was Bert, or was it Mark? Let's just pull up the names and I'll get it wrong in the video. <laughs> so let's see here. Yeah, Mark. Mark Burnett uh, released a huge amount of passwords, a lot of them public record already, but the difference was they were just the passwords, and you got, he has all of the usernames for them. So there's a torrent you can actually download. Um, available at, at the bottom of this, you can get the magnet link here. So 87 megabytes of uh, username and password data. Some of the data is sanitized, like company names and whatnot, but it's uh, basically released for research, so do check that out. Um, also, you may have heard about the Superfish certificate. Um, so Lenovo Machines, there's a, there's a number of articles going around on, the, on this, but uh, essentially, when it comes to uh, Lenovo, had this company called um, Superfish, who also worked with the company called Commodia out of Israel that does um, SSL interception stuff. So for advertising, they developed this, this piece of adware that's on all the Lenovo machines by default. And what actually happens, it has a man-in-the-middle attack on your system between your browser so it can actually inject ads into your system while you're viewing, viewing the web. And uh, a security researcher, well, a bunch of them, but I'm going to go to the uh, point to the guy at the Radisec, Robert Graham, who actually showed a, a, a symbol dissection of it. So actually, he found the actual private the certificate, the private one, the, the key is actually available in the adware along with the password. And he just used um, strings to pull it out, it's strings and grips, so a real, real ghetto way to do it, but it works. And so at that point, the the, the big problem with it is that that's it's the same on all machines. It's not different for every single one. So at this point, you can you can actually decrypt all, all the people's data if you have that information, or you need the public and the private key. So and that is actually available in online now at this point. Um, there's also a website out now for testing that. So you can go to this link here, filippo.io slash badfish, and that will actually check if your laptop is vulnerable. Um, also, uh, there is the announcement of HTTP2 being finalized with IETF. Um, that's going to, for NSM, a few things with that is that it's going to, we can't handle it at this point. At least I'm not aware of any tools that do because it is a binary protocol. This is version 2, and it offers a TLS over it at the application layer, I believe. So um, there's going to be a lot of uh, issues. Uh, moving on to do actual monitoring of HTTP, uh, HTTP version 2 uh, traffic. We'll see what's to come on that. Um, also, uh, the guy, uh, Champ Clark from Sagan, put out an article on um, using Sagan, the, the multi-threaded log analysis uh, engine, with uh, Bro's intelligence feeds. So you can, you can use that together with Bro, and I'm hopefully going to play with that at work if I get a chance. 
Uh, that article is available right here. And we're going to move into the next meeting section, uh, Conference Corner. So a Security Onion uh, four-day training is actually coming up in Houston, Texas, if anybody is interested. Uh, it's probably mostly for professionals and not students because uh, it is uh, the, the price is quite high. But uh, if you would like to have a four-day training class, do check that out. Um, Bam Fisher, the author of Squeal, actually added to a job post in here. So um, he's looking for a his company is looking for a cyber security technology lead at GM. So if anybody's interested in that, they do a lot of NSM stuff over there in this position. You do check that out. And uh, now we're going to move into tool trade. This is the meeting section where we talk about new tools or, or old tools that maybe we may have not heard of. So the first one I want to I'll talk about is Bro Intel Generator. This was actually posted. It's a little shell script that was posted to the Bro mailing list a few weeks ago that takes. Um, it actually it takes in a HTML document or a PDF and allows you to increase my size here. It allows you to pull out indicators like domain names, file hashes, and IP addresses from the PDF so that in format it into the Bro Intel framework format. So we can do a quick demo here. I had to make a I had to patch it real quick to actually get it to run on um, OS 10 because it looks for a. a the two, two packages in a particular path is, is not that the case in on OS 10 if you use, for example, if you use Bro or Brew or Mac ports. So but anyway, so you can take a look. Intel is going to SH, and we're going to feed it a file. I downloaded this um, Silence Operation Cleveland report, and I'm going to say, hey, this is a PDF or use dot dash P. And it's going to read through this PDF report and pull out the indicators of compromise. And so give you some information. You can pay, it actually wrote out three files caught uh, started DT, or three files in DT, and there's text files with the bro format because they use that as a convention. You can take a look at them. So let's just cattle three of these. You can see that you actually have the IP addresses, the hashes, and the domain names, but there's not in this particular case. For that, and you can actually just have uh, the bro Intel frame or the Intel frame read that in and use that to match against traffic. So that was, that was a cool tool. Um, I probably send that patch to the guy too, so he can add it in. Um, also, another one is MalDNS Search, a tool that I wrote a few years ago um, that matches. These are the, it basically takes a number of different uh, log files, uh, like bind DNS logs or bro uh, DNS log or condot log or uh, sonic wall logs or whatever. It supports a number of different ones and matches them against a, 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 mal ha hash or a malware list that has uh, IP addresses or domain names. So um, it's a fairly simple script. And uh, I wanted to point this out too because we got had, had a big update where I did 20% uh, improvement uh, a few days ago. And then Justin Azoff of the Bro team uh, uh, committed one that actually is 100% improvement using uh, associative arrays. So um, it's very fast now compared to what it was anyway. Hey, by the way, can someone hit the lights in the in the back? <laughs> All right, awesome. So I'll, I'll just demo that real quick. So here we're going to use uh, the passive. We're going to say we're going to read in a passive DNS log generated from the passive DNS tool. This is a bunch of domain names, uh, and then we're going to specify that particular log file, pdns.log, and then by default. It actually pulls in a Malhast uh, file list. I'll show you at the bottom. And at this point, you can see it actually downloaded it, the default list from Mahath, or from Mahendic Labs, and then it just searches through it and tries to find any matches for you. And then it should complete in just a moment. But you can pass uh, dash capital M, and then uh, there's a list of ones built in that will actually pull down the latest list from like from emerging threats, or you can pull down the mandate report or whatever else. There's a number of them built in. So at this point, you can see I found six of the all, nearly 2,000 entries from that malhost list, and this kind of reports it like that. So uh, nifty little tool if you want to look at historical log data to match it against things. So that's that. And then the last thing I want to talk about is uh, this tool called Snographer, which is developed by a guy at Google that Greg happens to know. Um, it is a packet capture or packet capture recording tool that focuses on speed. So um, I'm going to try to get this guy on, talk about it. So uh, they're doing, it looks to here, it says they're doing a 10 gigabits per second, a multi-core, multi-disc machine. So that's uh, that's of interest, definitely. So we'll have to check that out sometime. 
Uh, and then finally, the next section is paper period. And uh, so the United States Marine Corps, along with, I can't think of the name on top of the world, what it was on top of my head, uh, uh, Army Cyber Institute come, came out with a cyber defense review where they, they talk about law, history, tactics, operations, and policy of um, cybersecurity. And they have, they're going to publish a journal. And I don't know if they don't have an issue out yet, but it's going to be freely uh, available online. So you can check that out if you're interested in any of that information. And now we're going to turn it over to Greg. So uh, Greg's here from Google. He works on GER, the Rapid Response Framework at Google. He's given talks at Black Hat and other conferences, and specifically on this tool. And he'll be talking about, um, about GER. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Greg. All right. Stop the screen sharing, and then you can click yours now. Okay. How's that? Looks good. Okay. So yeah, my name is Greg. I'm going to talk to about talk to you about Go today. So um, if people have seen my Black Hat presentation, there's a little bit of that presentation in this. Um, but I go in. This is probably a, a better overview presentation than than that one was, since that was kind of purely focused on like one piece of the tool. So I'm going to talk a little bit of kind of about a little bit of background about why we built it, um, and but mostly focus on what it can do, and give you a live demo as well. So really quick bit about me. I'm a Go developer. I sit uh, in the Google Incident Response team at Google. I also have a pretty strong interest in OS 10 security. I was the OS 10 security guy at Google for a while. And uh, kind of before that, I was doing a bunch of other security-related jobs, so pen testing, incident response, audits, et cetera. So I'm going to start kind of where Go started, which was um, basically with a need for live, uh, live forensics. So here's a, a kind of a really common use case for anyone that's doing any sort of uh, network security monitoring. So you'll see a some sort of beaconing activity to a known bad domain. So you've got this domain that you know is a malware command and control domain, uh, and Joe's machine is madly beaconing out to it, sending HTTP requests that look like command and control traffic. So a typical respondent scenario might be to kind of pick up your forensics go bag and walk over to Joe's cube and uh, start doing some inspection of his machine. Maybe you can get some packet capture of the traffic. Maybe you can uh, do some memory analysis. Maybe you can retrieve some files and get a copy of the malware, this kind of thing. And that all gets really complicated uh, when Joe's here in Hawaii. Uh, he's you know maybe not great at security, but he's definitely really good at vacations. So he's having a really nice time on a boat off the Nepali coast in Hawaii, and you know it's going to be hard for you to go there. Well, it's maybe not going to be that hard for you to go there. It'll it'll be inconvenient, but it'll be fun. Uh, but it doesn't scale very well. So. He does have 3G internet there, so if you had a capability like Go, where you, you had a tool that was already in place, installed on the machine that just needs an internet connection, then you could do some sort of at least initial triage of this problem uh, and, maybe, uh, and maybe even do a full response to it uh, just completely over the internet. So another really common kind of use case is that a new APT report is released. So maybe it's advanced, maybe it's persistent, maybe it's even a threat. Uh, but basically guaranteed that at least it will have an interesting code name and maybe even a logo these days. So uh, my now fictional kind of go-to uh, logo for this sort of things is Bear Eagle Shark Laser, which is this code name I made up for a kind of fictional malware. So, you know, Bear Eagle Shark Laser report is out. We want to check all the things. And checking all the things can be really complicated. So there might be more than 50 indicators of compromise across two different operating systems, and all the things is tens of tens of thousands of machines across a large organization that are all mobile, that are all you know coming and going all the time. So without a capability like Go, it's really hard to do. At so we call that a fleet check. It's really hard to do a fleet check like that uh, without some sort of capability like Go. So what is Go? Go stands for Go Rapid Response. Uh, Despite what almost everyone thinks, the G isn't for Google. Uh, it's a recursive acronym and tradition of kind of GNU and Wine and YAML. 
it's an open source live forensics tool whereby live forensics, I mean, you know, we're not pulling disks out of machines and, and doing dead disk forensics. We're operating on the machine as it's running while the user's still using it. It's a Python agent that runs on the machine that talks over the internet to a Python server. Uh, and there's no, there's no kind of requirement for a corporate network or, or a university network or a, a VPN of any kind. It's anywhere there's an internet connection, go will work. Built into the tool is a disk forensics capability in the form of the sleuth kit and also a memory forensics capability in the form of the recall memory forensics framework, which is also open. Both of those things are also open source. It's scalable. We run it at very large scale ourselves, and there's a number of uh, pretty decent scale uh, open source installations uh, these days in, in the kind of tens of thousands uh, range of clients. It's a stable and low impact client. We've been running this on you know, desktops, laptops, and servers of some very opinionated engineers who watch the resource consumption on their machines and have top running constantly, that kind of stuff. Uh, so if we were doing a bad job here, we'd definitely know about it. And uh, we think we've been doing a pretty good job uh, in uh, you know, being efficient with the resources we use on the machine. And we've got full-time developers allocated to this project. So at the moment, we've got five. So it's a, you know, we're committed to this, uh, to this tool uh, for the long term. We've put significant development into it. So, okay, so, you know, we, we had these use cases. We figured we needed a, a tool to do something like this. Why not, um, you know, why make the build decision? Why not buy a Mandiant Mir or an NCase Enterprise or an FResponse or something like that? Uh, and so one of the main drivers there was we wanted a really deep level of customization that we weren't going to get from a commercial tool where we didn't have full access to the source and the ability to change whatever we liked. So we wanted to be able to, you know, make a big change, uh, respond to whatever threat we're facing today, and maybe deploy some custom detection or custom defensive me measures that would be hard to imagine kind of doing with any commercial tool where we're relying on other people to, to do work for us. And we wanted a, a large scale of concurrent analysis. So we wanted to have, you know, 50 plus analysts analyzing 50 machines in a really deep way and being able to look across, you know, easily tens of thousands of machines uh, to check things in, and get answers within a few minutes. We wanted to be able to move as fast or faster than the attacker. So, you know, be able to look at a machine in depth, get some information from there and then pivot it with that information across the whole fleet very quickly. And we wanted real support for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, so, you know, back when we first open sourced this in 2011, I think, you know, definitely all the commercial tools were, were basically Windows only. And I think it's still pretty much true today that the, the large commercial players here are, are mostly Windows focused still. And now, you know, we've been using this for quite a while and quite extensively inside Google that, you know, we, we couldn't imagine not having a, a capability like this and doing any form of effective incident response. So that's a little kind of overview of sort of why we built it and what the motivations were. So, and I've given you kind of an executive summary of the tool. So now I'm gonna dig into how it looks in a bit more detail. So this is kind of a server side architecture diagram. So clients poll over the internet to front end servers and in any kind of you know, reasonably large scale deployment, we'd expect a load balancer to sit in front of those. So we don't provide that, but you know, we expect uh, that organizations can lay their hands on some sort of load balancing. And so the, the polls come in from the clients to the front ends, so, and the front ends write those messages into the database. Uh, I'm gonna talk about kind of data store in, in, in more detail in a minute, but uh, the workers basically take those messages out. So the separate processes called workers that do the real work of uh, the processing, take those messages out, decide if there's any work for that particular client to do, and then write a uh, request for more information back into the database, which are, the front ends then send back to the clients. Uh, and it kind of, the, the kind of data flows like this. On the server side, it's basically a big uh, asynchronous state machine that's triggered by polls that come from the client. And there's a, there's a web UI, which you'll see in the demo, and also there's a uh, IPython-based uh, command line interface. So 
the clients, what do they look like? Uh, as I said, the, you know, these stable clients, we've been running them for a long time now. Uh, we do heavy monitoring of the clients. So we, we measure how many CPU seconds we use, how, how much, what our memory footprint is like, how many bytes we send on the wire for basically every action that we take. Uh, and so when we run these actions that are uh, big across the fleet, then we aggregate all those statistics up so we can see exactly, you know, we burnt this many CPU seconds, we sent this much, this many bytes on the wire, so we can kind of measure the impact of, of the actions that we're taking on, on all the individual machines. And not only do we measure it, but we also limit it. So we have some guarantees of, you know, we're not going to spend more than X seconds, CPU seconds on this. We're not going to send more than this on the wire. And if our memory footprint goes over X, then we're going to kill ourselves and kill the process and restart it. Uh, so clients work on a 10 minute poll period by default. So it's a HTTP poll that sends uh, encrypted and signed protocol buffers over HTTP to the server. Uh, every 10 minutes saying, you know, is there any work for me to do? Is there any work for me to do? Uh, and one of the key design decisions here was how smart should this client be? Uh, so we basically went for a, a very smart server and a somewhat smart client. So uh, it's not completely dumb, but it's reasonably minimal. So, and the reason why we kind of chose this approach was we wanted to be able to time travel backwards on the server. So we wanted to be able to, you know, say, do something like collect persistence mechanisms regularly. And then at some time in the future, look back on all the different things that we collected and say, oh yeah, we can see this run key appeared here. Uh, and, and that'll help us kind of uh, with a time frame for, for a compromise or identifying patient zero, that kind of stuff. Uh, and we also wanted to basically hold most of the complexity on the server so that our build and and fix and deploy times for bugs or new features is much faster. So we can we can deploy a new fast uh, a new server very quickly and put a new feature into the server very quickly, but uh, having to update you know many many thousands of clients uh, across the whole organization is a fairly slow process. So you know some clients will be in a desk drawer and they will you know a laptop will be in a desk drawer that won't, will get, only get turned on every three months or something. So basically, whenever you deploy a client you're gonna have that client around for a long time. So it also means we're gonna update less uh, if the client is not, if all the smarts aren't, aren't on the client, if most of the smarts are on the server, then we ha have to update it less often just because there's less stuff to change. And it also means that backwards compatibility is simpler just because less complexity, uh, less stuff that we need to refactor and do differently. And we also, during an active investigation, we're also leaking less of what we're doing to a, a potentially compromised machine. If, if most of the interesting decisions and analysis and parsing of data and all that sort of stuff happens on the server, then we can, it's not as obvious exactly how we're doing the investigation. And then on the server side, uh, as I said, the front ends pass messages, the workers do the real work. And everything is designed to be basically completely asynchronous. So um, the whole system is designed around clients disappearing at any moment. So, you know, I'll sleep my laptop and jump on a plane. And, you know, pe thousands of people are doing this all, all the time uh, on, on our corporate networks. So we need to be completely prepared for, you know, a machine to just completely disappear for hours, minutes, or days, or months, or whatever, and then be able to pick up where it was uh, when it comes back on the network. So that also means that uh, you should be able to queue network on this, uh, queue actions on the server. So if I want to investigate this machine, um, often it's not online right now because it's a laptop, you know, it comes up and down a lot and travels between networks a lot. Uh, then I'll basically be able to schedule a bunch of stuff that I want to happen when, when that machine comes online. And so when it does come online, uh, all, those, all those actions will be taken by Go. And I can also schedule a notification that, that will email me that says, hey, this machine that you were interested in analyzing is now online and you know the results of uh, the, the flows you ran. So in Go speak, a flow is kind of a, a high level unit of work like collect the file or whatever. Uh, the flows that you ran uh, are now complete. So data store is um, very abstracted in, in Go. So we have a number of different implementations and it's actually quite easy to switch between them. Uh, so these are the current open source offerings. We also have a proprietary one that we use internally. 
And we also know of uh, some other op open source users who've actually written their own proprietary internal data stores as well. Um, so there's uh, MySQL times two because we wrote an original one and then uh, one of the open source users basically rewrote the whole thing to the point where it was so different that it's now MySQL advanced, a, a separate data store. Um, there's also a MongoDB and a, and a sharded uh, uh, SQLite so that uh, you can kind of break the SQLite out into kind of many different files. Uh, so the ones that are running kind of open source deployments of uh, any significant st scale are the MySQL Advanced and the SQL Lite are the two ones that we know people are running it at a uh, at pretty big scale. And kind of one of the key, as I said already, like the the we want to preserve this axis of time. So we want to hold a bunch of information on the server about things that we've you know, collected from the client, and we want to be able to know, you know, be able to look back in time. And a key point, at part, a key way to do that is by basically, we hardly ever delete stuff out of the database. So we, we basically create new versions for everything. So if we stat a file or if we do a new process, process listing, then those things get written into the database as new versions of, of things that are already there. So demo. Um, how does this look? Is this text visible? Should I zoom in a bit more? No, looks good. Looks okay. Okay. Um, so on this on this demo Go server, I've got just two clients connected. So I have a a Windows 2012 client connect, collect, uh, connected and a, a Ubuntu trusty connected, and so. I'm going to run through kind of like a few different things you can do with Go that will give you kind of a, a reasonable overview of, of the capabilities. So you can imagine a scenario, you know, you've uh, done this hunt for your Bear Eagle Shark Laser malware, and then you've, you know, imagine that, you know, this isn't two machines in here, this is, you know, 100,000 machines or something. And uh, you want to distinguish the ones that are compromised by that malware. So what you can do is, uh, search for the machines using, so this is a search box here. I actually just search for dot, which is a shortcut to show you all the machines. Um, so you can actually apply labels to machines. So I'm going to apply the Bear Eagle label to these two machines, um, which, you know, which appears over here on the right. Um, so you can now treat these machines separately to the rest of the, the rest of the fleet. So uh, one thing you can do, which is cool, is hunt them separately. So a hunt in Go speak is when we when we do something across the whole fleet or groups of machines or or large groups of machines or even just kind of smaller groups of machines, but doing stuff on multiple machines. So I'm going to start a new hunt. Uh, and I'm actually going to use the artifact collector. So I'm going to talk about this in more detail, but um, basically, this gives us a simple way to collect a bunch of different uh, forensically interesting things from machines. So I'm going to uh, collect event logs from Windows. So there's a this is zoomed in, so it's kind of a little bit more kind of scrolly than it would normally be. But um, you can see over on the right here, this is going to grab application event logs, system event logs, uh, security event logs. Uh, and those are all actually artifacts themselves. So this is a, a meta artifact that collects other artifacts. So I'm going to collect, oh, whoops. Let's move that. Try again. Um, and I'm also going to, from Linux, I'm going to grab the auth logs. Uh, so you can see over here what it's going to collect. This is just auth.log star. So add that into the list. Um, now give this hunt a name. So this is demo hunts. So here are these these parameters, the client limit, expiry time, and the rate are quite interesting. So the way we run hunts here is we basically usually put like a limit of about a hundred machines on any hunt that we run to start with. So you can run it on a hundred machines and then see what the impact is. So you can see, oh, I use this many CPU seconds. I use I sent this much, this many bytes, uh, and that way you basically get a random sampling of, you know, uh, the impact of what this is on the uh, on the whole fleet. Uh, and then the, the expiry time is just 
how long this hunt will be relevant for. So if a machine polls in, you know, a month from now, should it still run this hunt or not? And uh, the client rate is how fast to schedule new clients. So we can, if the hunt is really intensive, we can make this go really slowly. So this is 20 clients a minute. So to kind of help our server out and not overload it by basically dosing it, uh, we can we can kind of make this go slower and gradually ramp up on the hunt, or we can just take this limit off and go as fast as we can. And if we go as fast as we can, we can basically get every machine, sort of no matter how many there are, um, reporting results within under an hour is basically uh, the the usual time. So any machine that's online would report in in that time and and complete the hunt. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna start that. So here, if I wanted to, I can add an output plugin. So this is uh, a way to get data out of Go. I'm going to talk about this in more detail as well, too. So um, there's a couple of options kind of available by default. So you can you can write all the results out as, as CSV, um, in, in which if you're collecting files, out, files that'll be like a bunch of metadata. So basically, what you get from a file system stat. So you know, like Mac times, file size, that kind of stuff that would get written out. Or if like you know, this is a hunt for something you're not expecting to find, then you could get Ica to send you an email for every one that it does find um, because you, you might really want to know about it if it's some bad class of malware or something. Uh, so I'm not going to do that for this hunt. Uh, and here we can set a rule type. So we can hunt just Windows machines. We can hunt just Linux machines, just OS 10 machines, uh, a bunch of other parameters. We can kind of control exactly which machines this hunt will run on, but for this one, I'm actually just going to hunt the bear eagle label. So I'm just going to hunt those two machines that I labeled before. Uh, so this is what it looks like. I'm going to get event logs and Linux auth logs, and I'm going to use the artifact collector flow to get them. So I've created the hunt now. So it shows up here in the pause state. And so that just means that it's not actually running yet. Um, so I'm going to talk about the authorization model a bit for, uh, in another few slides time, but basically before this step would work, so I'm about to run this, but before that would work normally, I'd have to get an approval to run it uh, if you're using the, the kind of two-party authorization system. So while that's going, uh, I'm going to um, just quickly show you a really sort of, I don't know, a really kind of basic memory hunting uh, capability. So recall gives us a lot of really powerful memory hu hunting capabilities. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to show you like a really simple one, which is doing a process listing by looking at um, just raw memory and then, and then working through the data structures in raw memory using recall. So this is on the uh, Windows 2012 machine. So I'm going to kick that off. Um, and while I'm waiting for that to go, well, actually, I think that's probably, let's go back and look at the hunt. That's probably finished. Yeah, so uh, just looking here, so you can see that I can download the result, all of the results of the hunt, so I can zip them up. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's event logs and auth, um, auth logs from Linux. So I can just download all the hunt results uh, in, in a tarball. Uh, and it's actually, goes actually really smart about kind of, what data it will deliver to you. So often with a hunt, you'll, you know, get 10,000 copies of uh, the identical same thing, and there's only five that are actually different. So Go will just build a, 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 a tarball here that has a bunch of symlinks that all kind of show you all of these machines have the same file, and but will only have like, you know, six files actually in it. So it won't you won't download gigabytes of exactly the same data uh, when you could just be really interested in like the few that are different. So here are the kind of results. We've got the, the auth log from Linux uh, and the event logs from Windows. Uh, and so we can click on these uh, to see them. So here's the, the event logs we collected. Uh, just move this. Um, and so there's a bunch of information here. I could download just this file if I wanted to uh, using this button here. Uh, I could also download it. If it's a really big file, you might be better off downloading it with the command line just because, you know, browser might time out and you might lose it. Um, and you can see here, you know, we can look at, you know, uh, 
a text version or, or a hex editor kind of view of, of the file that, uh, file that we collected. So um, just while I'm here, I'll also show you just, you can actually browse the, um, the remote file system directly. So, you know, if you just want to kind of look through some directories and look for something in particular, so it's like here's system 32 on this Windows machine. Um, it, you can filter this stuff. So if we filter for like notepad, uh, that'll show up here. And then you can, um, you don't have to go through the interface I, I used before. You can download files from here directly. So let me just kind of move this so you can see. Um, so uh, I've actually downloaded this file before, so it's already here, but I could download the version I've already downloaded from the client, or I could tell it to, with this button, get a completely new version uh, from the client. Okay, so, um, so I showed you the hunt, uh, and I also ran this this recall um, this recall flow that gives you a process listing. So let's go look at the results of that. Um, so here's the results of the recall process listing. Uh, so this has come from raw memory uh, using a, a a memory driver to get at at the raw memory on the machine, and then if you click on kind of any of these, it will give you a bunch of interesting information about this particular process and uh, also kind of in the same format as the, uh, in, in the Cybox format, so using the Cybox schema for uh, how to represent a process. Okay. So that's the demo. So let me switch back to slides. So um, you may have noticed uh, this tool has a rather large amount of power. So it has access to raw memory and raw disk. And so with those capabilities, you can basically know anything there is to know from that machine. So this is the obligatory kind of Spider-Man reference for with great power comes great responsibility. So I mentioned the two-party authorization system. So um, the, you don't have to run it this way, but uh, this is kind of the the authorization system that we ship with, basically to take any of those actions. So to, to start a hunt or to get access to any particular machine, you'd have to get an approval from someone else on the team. So you basically get this pop-up that says, you know, you need an approval for this. Uh, and then you can enter a reason, which is, you know, an investigation ID or a bug ID or something like that. So as well as authorization, there's a bunch of kind of auditing and logging that's available. So uh, you can log at the database uh, level, which is something we do. Uh, you, the, all, Go has this concept of audit events that are created whenever any anything interesting happens. So uh, they're created when you request authorization for a machine, when you give authorization, when you run a flow. So if you collect a file or if you collect an artifact from a machine, uh, any of those things generate these audit events. And you can set up listeners to do basically whatever you want with them. So you can push them into syslog and then transport them, you know, to get off host logging, or you could integrate them with whatever kind of auditing and logging system you'd like them uh, to integrate with. And you can create more too. Uh, so you can create audit events for kind of whatever actions you'd like to audit. There's also kind of a, another layer of visibility uh, and accountability that comes with the approval email. So when you request for these approvals, uh, you can, have it go to a CC list. So there's, we, there's a team list that you can use kind of to basically, so everyone can see, partly so that people aren't blocked waiting on a single person for approval when someone else could approval, approve it, but um, also as a measure of accountability for kind of how the tool is being used. So uh, that's kind of a reasonable uh, reasonably detailed introduction to the tool and hopefully with the demo you got a bit of a picture for kind of like how that works. So I wanted to step back up to the high level again and just talk about how we think this fits into the kind of broader picture of defensive tools. And this is kind of what we're going for. We're going for being this, this advanced live forensics that works at scale, that works remotely really reliably and quickly. 
And so kind of at a slightly more zoomed in level, what does that mean? It means mostly being really, really good at collecting stuff. And this is kind of what we're aiming at. So uh, we want to be good at collecting things that are hard to get at because the operating system doesn't normally let you get at them, like full registry hives on Windows or, or files that, are, that are, are locked for reading, that kind of stuff, uh, or maybe deleted files. Uh, and also stuff that's hard to get any other way. So uh, some really interesting, uh, a lot of the really interesting forensics research these days is basically memory-based forensics. So uh, recall is really at the front of all that uh, effort and is doing some really interesting uh, stuff with memory analysis that you know, uh, is, is kind of impossible to get the results any other way. So we want to have like this operating system view uh, kind of under the OS this forensics view and the memory forensics view, kind of all three of those ideally. So, you know, ideally you could look at a binary from all three of those perspectives and, and, and uh, check and see if any of them are different. And we also want to be able to kind of address these like really hard to specify locations too, where, where variations across the fleet make it difficult to, to reason about where a file is going to be on a machine. Uh, and that basically comes down to uh, the artifacts system, which I showed you briefly kind of in, in the demo there, um, where artifact, you know, this SANS defines artifact as kind of a combination of description, location, and interpretation. Uh, I think I prefer, like, it's it's usually just that stuff I want that's on the machine. Um, and artifacts, like, you know, if you go looking uh, in, uh, you know, kind of forensics forums and, and mailing lists where people talk about these sort of things, you'll see artifacts like these, like, oh, this is where the Chrome history lives and, and this is where Dropbox installs to and this is where mail is uh, stored for this particular mail client on OS X kind of stuff. But uh, this is all kind of like really inconsistent and hard to use because all of this stuff is actually not filled in for you. So like, what is it C drive or D drive or E drive that Windows is installed on? Uh, what, what users are on this particular machine? Uh, what user SIDs are in the registry for Windows? Uh, on OS 10 and Linux, you know, where are the home directories? What users uh, have home directories? Uh, all of those things are, are really quite hard to address across a global fleet. I mean, how do, you, how do you reference something that is inside a user's home directory? It's a really big problem because that's where most, or if a lot at least, of the uh, forensically interesting artifacts are. So. So one thing we've done uh, with the artifacts effort is that we've come up with a, a common language to kind of reference reference some of that stuff. And we basically go looking for it with GUR. So we'll, we'll build information about each machine that includes like all the user accounts that are on it, uh, as well as really useful environment variables like local app data on Windows. Uh, and so you'll be able to kind of simply reference these things without, uh, and so GUR is basically handling all the complexity of like, how you actually reference a home directory across a fleet of tens of thousands of machines. And so once you can do that, then you can start writing these like simple uh, forensic artifacts. So we've come up with this, uh, this YAML format, which is you know, human readable and machine readable. And this one's for a Windows event log. So this says, this is where the Windows event log lives. Uh, this particular path is relevant for these particular versions of Windows. For older versions of Windows, you're going to uh, you're going to need a different artifact that you know tells you where it is. Um, you can kind of label these into categories, and then uh, this particular artifact is only supported on Windows, obviously. And here's a link to you know more information about what this actually is. So we built a whole library of these. Uh, so we've got about. And, and we actually split it out from GUR. So this is now completely independent of GUR. There's this library of YAML artifacts uh, at, uh, in, this, in this GitHub project. And we're collaborating with the forensicartifacts.com guys uh, who already had a, a library of artifacts. So we're basically making them machine readable. So there's about 100 there. And then GUR itself has a few that are kind of GUR specific ways to do things. Uh, that, so there's probably about 130 total uh, in both locations. But this is reusable by any other tool. Basically, you just need to be able to read YAML and then know enough about the machine to populate some of those things like, like the home directories and, and maybe some of the environment variables. Uh, you, it's used actively by us, so we use it in investigations. So we have a vested interest in keeping it up to date and, uh, and accurate. And you know, we obviously you know, welcome other people contributing to that repository and 
reporting any problems or bugs and contributing new artifacts. All that's, all that's really welcome. So, okay, so we've aimed at being this like really, really great collection tool, being able to collect from in lots of different ways. So once we've got all that information, how are we gonna do our analysis? So basically outside GUR is mostly the answer. So we don't wanna reinvent uh, kind of the analysis wheel. Uh, so we mostly think like for the most part, this is better suited to you know heavy statistical analysis packages or uh, systems that are already designed to analyze big data in uh, interesting ways. So we're basically making it easy as possible, as easy as possible to get the data out into systems that are gonna be better at analyzing it. And this is how we use it internally too. So there's some HTTP RPC APIs you can use to, to move data out of Go, which are kind of just in the process of being developed now, but uh, are getting to be reasonably complete. Uh, but there's also the, you saw during the demo, there's this hunt export plugin system. So uh, the open source ones we ship with a, a CSV uh, and, and the email kind of export. But uh, I mean, in reality, if you, if you wanted to do this at scale, you should probably write like an Elasticsearch plugin or something like that. So we've got something very similar to this. Uh, so you might know the, the Google product uh, BigQuery. We basically use something very similar to that internally. So we've written an uh, output plugin to export to that format internally. And we're basically doing our analysis using that. So, uh, but yeah, you know, if you wanted to do this at scale, then Elasticsearch or BigQuery output plugin should be, you know, easy to write and um, a, a good choice. So uh, that's, most of what I have for kind of like how the tool works. Uh, so I wanted to give you a, a bit of information about kind of what we're working on now and what's coming up. So one thing we want to make better, we do some of, but we want to make better is having this event triggered collection. So a really typical kind of scenario is there's a network monitoring, uh, some network monitoring signal fires that says, you know, something bad's happening on this machine. And then an analyst looks at it and then uh, schedules a GUR flow to collect something from that machine to help them figure out what's going on. And often, you know, because there's some time has passed before the analyst has looked at it, the machine maybe is now offline. So sometime in the future, that machine will kind of report in, report its results, and then an analyst will come and look at it again and try and figure out what's happened. So we basically want to crunch down all that waiting and remove as much of it as possible. and and have like, you know, where there's a, a signal that has a good investigative path that we know we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, then we're gonna just gonna schedule that flow straight away. The machine's probably online because we just got an alert about it. We're probably gonna get the results pretty much straight away. And then by the time the analyst is actually looking at the alert for the first time, there's already a, maybe the whole investigation or at least some of the investigation uh, and the context required to, to kind of analyze that alert is already complete. Uh, we're also working on uh, an experimenting with a, a C++ client to kind of be the always on piece of Go that, so we're, we're, we're basically aiming at a smaller memory footprint and uh, some more efficient kind of, hopefully faster um, protobuf uh, serialization and deserialization and crypto operations and that kind of stuff. Hopefully speeding some of that up and getting some performance gains there and basically bringing up Python whenever uh, we need to do something more complicated uh, that involves the rest of the capabilities. Uh, we're working on more powerful artifact collection. So at the moment, uh, you can basically have an artifact that describes where stuff is, and then a parser that is attached to that artifact, but that's basically it. Uh, so we wanna be able to have uh, an artifact that says this is where stuff is, and then have a parser, and then have the output of that parser feed other artifacts, and that artifact feed another artifact. So you can kind of chain all these things together. Uh, without having to write any sort of real code, just writing some YAML description as, of what you want to do, basically. Um, so, and we also want to have kind of like a default collection me mechanism that also give the the person writing the 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 artifact like control over some some measure of control over how it's collected as well too. Uh, and we're also uh, kind of in the process of making it easier to deploy Go with lots of different labels into lots of different environments. So uh, we're now collecting and kind of inside the UI reporting different statistics on 
uh, you know, different labeled clients so that we can answer questions like, oh, you know, we just installed it on uh, a thousand Ubuntu machines with this label. Do you see those reporting in and make sure that we have, we can see those reporting in. And we also want to uh, kind of make building the clients a lot easier. So I've uh, been doing some work to kind of automate the, the building of the clients and the labeling of them. Uh, so you can uh, build and label a whole bunch of clients uh, quite easily. So, okay, great. Uh, you've really sold me on this, Greg. That's good. Uh, I want to try it now. Uh, so what do I need to do? So um, basically get a 64-bit Linux machine. It doesn't have to be Ubuntu, but it's probably going to make your life, life easier if it is, because uh, then you can just run this quick start script. It's going to install a bunch of packages and uh, ask you a few questions uh, about kind of how you want things configured. And then it'll start the server. And so you just open a browser and then you can download and install the, uh, the clients uh, from, from, the, from the UI itself. Uh, it should, to kind of like get all this done, is probably about 20 minutes of work. Uh, once you have the machine uh, kind of ready, then it's, yeah, sort of, as long as it takes to download the packages and install them, basically. Uh, so, and so here's a whole bunch of links. So here's our homepage and links to uh, a whole bunch of other tools that are either directly related or we use quite regularly or are part of our kind of like open source forensics uh, tool suite. Um, yeah, so that's about all I have. I'm happy to take any questions you guys might have. Awesome. Uh, Guru looks really cool. Um, I have a question. It's not any no. It's not for any specific use case or anything. But I'm just curious if uh, you can execute command on the clients from the server. Yeah, if you, you want, can. If you want to do a off shell command. Okay. I'm yeah. So it, it's actually pretty useful. Um, so uh, yeah, we've we've kind of because because uh, we've gone for this like uh, client that is less smart. It's not a super smart client. Sometimes you want to do something that the client doesn't have the capability to do and you want to do it quickly. You know, you don't want to wait until whenever the next client release is going to be uh, and build the functionality in. You just want to kind of run something and then get results back. Uh, and yeah, we do this kind of reasonably regularly uh, and it is pretty useful capability. So the way it works is that uh, you sign whatever bit of code it is. It might be like a shell script or a Python file or a Windows executable or you know, a compiled C, ELF, or whatever, um, and upload it to the, the GUR server, and then you can run it, uh, you know, on a single machine, or you can run it as a hunt across, you know, lots of machines or all your machines. Okay, cool. Yep. Uh, Travis in the chat had a question. Um, he wants to know if you can search for a known hash across your fleet. Yeah, so we get asked this question a lot. Um, <laughs> so, the short answer is yes. I'll give you the slightly longer answer though. So a lot of the time I think people share fairly weak uh, indicators of compromise that are like not that useful. So just if you just have a hash, like you literally, that is the only thing you have. You don't have say like a file path where this, where this file might be. You don't have a file size. You don't have like any indication of what the file content might be. If literally the only piece of information you have is a hash, then yeah, you can go look for it. But you know, are you going to look for it across, I don't know, 100,000 machines? Are you going to hash the entire disk of 100,000 machines to look for the file? You know, it's 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 a really kind of expensive way to look for things, uh, and it's really fragile. So you know, if you're looking for malware, then you know you're basically relying on getting exactly the same version of malware that someone else got. So maybe you know, they compiled it, you know, after like your the sample of malware you get is like, you know, different because they just recompiled it or they, they tweaks something slightly in the malware or it has a campaign code built into it that's uh, tailored to your particular environment. So, you know, that one bit difference means that you would then miss it uh, if you are hunting by hash. So normally we tell people that this is not kind of the greatest way to do this, that you know, a much stronger way would be to get, uh, build some kind of uh, content signatures. So you can grep inside, inside files with Go and you could grep across. So say you know that like 
inside the first 100 bytes of this file, there's pretty much always a byte string of blah. Uh, and so you could look, instead of like having to open every file, read the entire file, hash the entire file, you could just look in the first 100 bytes of, of these files. And then if you can limit it and you know, like say, oh, this always goes into system 32, or this always goes into program files, or this always goes, this is a, I don't know, a launch daemon or something on, on OS X. Um, if you're going to look in a particular place, then that's obviously also a lot faster than, than hitting the entire disk. But yeah, like no one's really going to thank you if you hash their entire disk just because, you know, someone shared kind of bad indicators with you. Um, so yeah, the, the short answer is, yeah, you can do that. But the long answer is you probably don't want to. Um, yeah. Also, if anybody has any questions that um, that are remote, um, you can unmute yourself and then ask the question and then mute yourself again. Or you can or you can paste your question into the chat and uh, Greg can look at it or I can read it off too. So. Um, I have another question. Let's see yeah. here. Um, sorry, I'm chatting at the same time. Um, Oh, do you know anybody that's doing any sort of um, automation? I know you're talking about your event triggering in the future work, but it, can you like um, say you have the YAML file for the indicator? Can you just somehow query the API? If uh, I'm assuming that, that may be available, I'm not sure, but to actually go ahead and get your fleet to to look for that artifact. Or, uh, basically, yeah. I'm kind of thinking only working with Cuckoo. If you, if you know there's a known binary, getting some data from that, and then you know, using the API or maybe the, a command line tool that maybe it includes with to actually do automated analysis. Yeah, so I mean, um, the, the HTTP APIs are basically going to be the way to do this. So it, it I mean, so there is actually, I, I ran into a project that um, I haven't actually talked to them, but someone out there has written a project uh, that is uh, attempting to do um, automated GER collection uh, uh, triggered by Snort alerts. Uh, I, I saw this, you know, had kind of no input from us or you know, it just kind of turned up uh, and was kind of interesting. So people are trying to do this. Um, I think, so from memory, I think they probably use the console, like the command line interface to, to do that stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the way of doing this in the future will be the, the HTTP RPC API where you basically be able to call like, you know, artifact collector flow uh, and and I guess uh, probably, I don't know. I, I think probably the way you want to do that is define your artifacts beforehand. Uh, so like, you know, if we see, um, you know, this particular type of alert, then we're going to fire this particular artifact. Um, and then, you know, the, the RPC is just telling go to do that, to collect that artifact. Um, but we could maybe also, uh, maybe APIs for uh, dynamically adding um, artifacts might also make sense. Okay, cool. Yeah. Anyone else in the room have any questions? We get one more in the chat. Uh, okay, so we get another question from the chat. Uh, Travis asked um, if there's any integrate any uh, node integrations with Yara or OpenIOC. So not right now. Uh, so recall can actually hunt Yara signatures in memory, which is super cool. Um, but the kind of more conventional, like finding stuff on disk, uh, Yara signatures we, we, we don't support. We might in the future, uh, it's kind of up for debate about, um, so there's definitely one open source user who's uh, a big open IOC fan uh, and they, they're very interested in um, getting OpenIOC to work. Um, so I think they're going to work on that. Uh, I think we're more likely probably to do some combination of artifact collection and, uh, and Yara maybe uh, as a kind of, you know, here's where the data lives. And then Yara does kind of like the decision logic. So like if this thing and this other thing, then that's bad. Um, but yeah, kind of not built in. I mean, you can't take a library of, of uh, OpenIOX and run it on Go at the moment. Um, you can run uh, Yara signatures with Recall, 
uh, as long as you're using like recent recall. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Questions? Okay. Well, I think uh, Gur looks really sweet. Um, I would definitely like yeah, to thanks. deploy this. Um, <laughs> How many how many how many machines are you uh, doing that over at Google? Your deployment size. Yeah, so I mean we've got more than a hundred thousand um, clients deployed. A huge number. <laughs> and you don't, and um, I imagine you don't have any performance issues, and like you were talking about earlier. You're so I mean it's it's a, it's a big complicated much. it's a big complicated problem running a uh, any sort of collection at that kind of scale. Um, so we're constantly refining how we do things. I mean, if you're following the repository closely, you will have seen like we completely reinvented how the queuing system works, and that was that was to take some of the heat off um, uh, some some particular worker queues that were uh, you know being really kind of hot rows in, in the database that had to get updated a lot. Um, so we split split out kind of like how the queues worked, and, and I think that's uh, that's been quite a good change. But we're basically yeah, I mean, we've been we've been using this at a pretty significant scale for a number of years now, uh, so we're um, we're pretty confident about the scale, uh, and it was definitely designed for it. Um, kind of until recently, I also had to put a big caveat on that that you know where this is based on our experiences with our own kind of internal data store, but now others are are running kind of you know. Tens of thousands of clients uh, on the on the open source data stores and and uh, it's performing well. So um, I'm kind of more happy saying that you know the open source the open source scales as well. So I'm curious, why don't you guys use um, MySQL or an open source database schema? <laughs> Just you know, like if you've got an amazing, uh, amazingly performant, industry leading database. For free, um, would would you use it? You know, it's it's kind of um, we'd be crazy basically not to take advantage of some of the infrastructure that Google has because you know it's it's very well maintained and well supported inside Google. It it runs lots of other products, and we get a lot of benefits from using those those kind of uh, you know those those kind of products uh, internally. So um, you know, like. It's it's just a case that we'd be fairly crazy not to, um, basically. Yeah, I wasn't giving you shit. I was just wondering. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's no valid question. Definitely. All right. Well, I think that uh, that summarizes it all. Um, Greg, uh, thank you for donating your time. I enjoyed yeah, the talk. No I think we. Her looks really, really useful. <laughs> um, we will have this video uploaded to YouTube. It'll be available online, I'll also on, on Vimeo. Uh, what did you say? Can confirm. Oh, yeah, <laughs> William can confirm how awesome it is. Um, <laughs> I guess that and that's it. Um, yep. So if you're if you're not a part of the OpenNSO mailing list, do do join. Um, and also, uh, you know, uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, and if you if you know anybody that is able to sponsor us to help out so, so we can do our research and so that we can develop our lab, um, do let us know so that we can get in touch with them. Um, thank you guys and have a good night. Take care. Great. Thanks, guys.